The next chapter with Prim's Ripapad is a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, everybody, it's Prem. Welcome to the next chapter presented by Baron Davis and Slick Studios. This week, I sit down with renowned high performance psychologist, author, and one of the world's leading experts on the relationship between the mind and human performance, Dr. Michael Gervais. Mike, which he has asked to go by, has worked with dozens of world-class performers, Olympians, record holders, and champions as well, including the Seattle Seahawks when they won the Super Bowl in 2014. He is also the founder of the Finding Mastery podcast, the co-creator of the Performance Science Institute at the USC Marshall School of Business, and the co-author of Compete to Create, an approach to living and leading authentically, which he did alongside Seahawks coach Pete Carroll. Now, we recorded this interview back in 2019, but I actually met Mike a couple of years prior. I did an NFL countdown piece while I was still working at ESPN on him and Seahawks wide receiver Doug Baldwin on the topic of mental imagery. And I was so intrigued by what Mike had to say, I had to bring him back on the show where I had to go back for more. So in this hour plus long interview, we talk about a lot of things, including what he does as a sports performance expert and how that differs from a conventional psychologist and also the strategies he uses to help athletes and leaders optimize their performance and also how his own struggles during childhood motivated and fueled him to become a performance expert and focus on optimization rather than dysfunction within the mental health context. At the time of this interview, he was still with the Seahawks, whom he parted ways with the year after in 2020. So here we are sitting at the Seahawks training facility in Renton, Washington, talking and discussing and also just doing a lot of laughing. What do you prefer to be called? Dr. G, Dr. Michael, Dr. Gervais? <laughs> yeah. My family calls him Mike. 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 Yeah, <laughs> definitely not that. <laughs> That's not what I've heard, actually. Um, yeah, Mike. My name's Mike. My training, you know, is a uh, PhD in psychology with a specialization in sport and performance. I mean, you earned the doctorate title, so, you know... I can, you can call it it. like, that's fine, you know, but Dr. G go by Mike. Yeah. Okay. Um, How are you doing? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Life is really good. You have that look as though you were just rushing from somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) I think I have that look. You know, we've had that conversation I think before. Um, Because every, every time I turn and pay attention to what you're doing, you're always somewhere doing something for someone, with someone, you have your private practice, you work with the Seahawks, Mm -hmm. you have your Compete to Create with Coach Pete Carroll, Mm -hmm. you have your Finding Mastery podcast, which is awesome. You get some serious guests on that show. Yeah, it's been a blast. I mean, the community right now is a very exciting time for people talking about psychology, Mm -hmm. talking about how to organize your inner life to flourish, whatever that means, high performing living, whether that means living with purpose and meaning, But like, it's a very exciting time because we're able to talk about it at scale. And so the idea of that nexus between impact and scale, so long and deep with one person is really what's required for impact. Sustainable growth arcs for people requires deep work. And then to do that at scale, it's like a very exciting time right now. It really is. Uh, I think we've, we've all seen, whether we are in media or outside or working with athletes, we're starting to see the mental health space grow and grow. Um, well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Because there's two ways to think about psychology, right? Dysfunction and optimization. And I like to think about it on a spectrum. And there are people that are really struggling with illness, psychological illness. And then there are people that are absolutely flourishing. And so there is a spectrum that's taking place. And right now, again, is an exciting time because the most extraordinary people in the world are raising their hand to say the inner life matters. Mm -hmm. And some of them are struggling, depression, anxiety, some other stuff. And some of them are saying, I just want to be my very best. I feel really good, 
but I know there's more in me. And I think that that concept that people know that there's more in them is very true right now. Yeah. And so we're talking about it. And what's great about where the field of psychology is, is that, well, let me go upstream for a minute, okay, is that thoughts are invisible. Gravity is invisible, but we know the effects of gravity. We can't see gravity, but we see what happens when you drop something, right? The th the, our mind is invisible, thoughts are invisible, but we know they exist, just like gravity, but we can see the artifact of thoughts. We can see the impact of thoughts, which is our physiology, the way our body feels, emotions, our physical events, verbal and nonverbal communications are forms that we can observe. And so when we go back upstream and say, okay, there's only three things that we can train to live an extraordinary life, to flourish, train our craft, train our body, and train our mind. That's it. Everything fits in one of those three buckets. Mm -hmm. Best in the world are not leaving any of them up to chance, let alone the mind. They're not leaving it up to mind. So it's, again, an exciting time because the extraordinaries are saying, hey, listen, whether I'm struggling or I'm up on this optimization, optimization side, I want to train my mind. Yeah. I want to put handles on this thing so I can literally do reps and sets of conditioning. Yeah. It's, so I couldn't be more excited about it. Well, and it also benefits you since you've been in the field for a number of <laughs> yeah. years. So it, it yeah. works out. Business is good. Yeah. Business, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. business is really good. Um, it is interesting to analyze and observe the growth within the world of psychology because as you yeah. said, it, it goes in so many different spectrums. And at least I would consider it under the umbrella of psychology. It is about mental health and the anxiety and depression where, where we're seeing a lot of athletes come out and, and be open and honest about that. But then it is about the maximization of performance, which is what you do. I know you were recently at the Aspen Institute Ideas Festival um, with DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love, two guys who, who have been really outspoken about their anxiety issues. Um, what be, Psychology has been around for, what, since the, since the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sports psychology is a newer field, but it's been around the 90s, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. But why, why oh, now? So earlier. It was oh, earlier than that. Yeah. earlier? Yeah, it's about 60 years old. Okay. Yeah. But what's happening right now within the landscape? Why are we seeing more people talk about mental health and also be willing to share their story. Okay. I think if we look and go backwards for just a minute is that, and let's just use sport for a moment, is that the most advanced avant-garde coaches, like the ones that were really cutting edge, a couple decades ago, they said, hey, there's this new field called strength and conditioning. I bet if we invested in and brought some, let's bring some of those guys in and see, like, could we get our guys bigger, faster, stronger to, you know, like have a little bit more energy or vibrance in the fourth quarter? Okay. So that field took off and it has done pretty well. And before that, coaches did everything. They were the, the moms, the dads, they were the, you know, life coaches, the sports psychologists, yeah. they were the strength coaches, they were the technical coaches, they made the food, they were the nutritionists, they, they did everything. So then some of the, you know, progressive coaches brought this S and C in, um, strength and conditioning. And then they said, oh, okay, well, we're bigger, faster, stronger, but we're actually getting some more knickknacks. So medical came in, ATC, right? Medical came in and then nutrition. And guess where we are now? Yeah. Psychology. So the progressive coaches are saying, hey, <laughs> you know, like we're maximizing all these other domains as a high performance model, we've, we're checking a lot of boxes and doing great work. Where's the frontier? Well, the frontier is the mind. And it's one of the three main pillars to, for people to train. And so it's just happening. It's organic. It's natural. We're standing on the shoulders of incredible science right now. And um, we're not at that nascent stage where we're making things up. We've got real research-based best practices that we can employ at scale with those that want to train to figure out mm -hmm. what lies dormant in them, can it be expressed mm -hmm. in any environment and hopefully under any condition? It, it is interesting. Um, you know, and I wanted to talk to you uh, because I know that this is a space that you are very adept in, but also with this show, addressing transitions. It's a very 
focused uh, show and we address so many different, there's, you know, you and I were talking yesterday about just kind of game planning about what we're going to talk about today. And, and you shed some light on some other transitions that I didn't even think about. Um, but how much of the work that you do in trying to maximize an athlete's performance has to do with a transition or a change in either their personal life or their athletic life? That's, I mean, there are transitions for sure that are embedded in the arc of people that want to grow. And right now, when we talk to young athletes, they're going to retire at some age. And when they retire, they don't even necessarily know the jobs that will be available, not because jobs are going away, but because industries are changing so fast, mm -hmm. technologies are changing so fast, that some of the jobs that their parents had are not going to be around. So there's another transition. So there's the transition in, there's the transition with uh, some sort of injury process, there's the transition out. Those are the big frames, if you will. But that transition out is not what it used to be, like I'm going to go get my law degree or that'll probably still be the case, or I'm going to go set up shop and build a business or go work for a large firm. There's going to be industries that are emerging underneath our feet right now that we don't even know what the landscape in 20 years is, 10 years is going to look like. So if we, if we stop thinking about what I'm going to do and we start to invest in who I am and my ability to eloquently adjust to the unfolding, unpredictable, unknown. Mm. Okay, that's the mark of mastery, mastery of self. Can I eloquently adjust to this unfolding moment, this unfolding week, day, whatever month, when I don't know how it's gonna go? And those that can't do that suffer from anxiety. So an anxiety disorder is the dysfunctional way of thinking about the future that becomes overwhelming. Mm. And those that have mastery of self they're able to embrace that unfolding, unpredictable unknown. And so there are easy frames for us to look at at transition, but I think the big takeaway when we go upstream is how well are you able to adjust to the unpredictable? And athletes are great at it. They're very good at really? it. Really? Yeah, very good at it. So the, the, you're looking like I'm, I'm kind of... No, yeah. I don't know why I was, I don't know why I was so shocked because I think... Wait, hold on. Yeah. How long did you play tennis? Uh, 20 something. Did you know years, any of your years. outcomes? Did you know any of your outcomes before you stepped on? No, the, not one. Yeah. So by definition, you didn't know how it was going to go. And what did you do? You practice your tail off craft, body and mind, hopefully all three. And you showed up <laughs> yeah. and you said, I'm going to bring my very best. And you had an idea. You used your imagination to have an idea of how you'd like to be yeah. and how you'd like it to go. But you ultimately didn't know. And then hopefully somebody across the net was highly skilled to help you bring out the best in you, yeah, right? That's true. Yeah, so that's like the, in, in my mind, like it doesn't get much better than that. Like I'm not talking about love and I'm not talking about deep purpose, but those environments to call on us so that we can bring our very best on a regular basis. And so that's dealing with stress. No, that's a good, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. But then I'll provide a, a different point of view or I'll be the devil's advocate. advocate. But it's, isn't that kind of Who a control? the devil's advocate? <laughs> like, what, what are we? Are we going to advocate for the devil? Are you really going to take that? No, no. <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah, you heard that in your was, head too. Like, no, I was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when my mind is going, I don't really pay attention to what's coming <laughs> out of my mouth, which I'm in a bad field <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> um, no, no, take the take the counter on this. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's let's go. Um, on. But but could one argue that that's kind of a controlled environment? So you know you're going into an unexpected um, environment, but you know that it's structured in the sense of, I'm gonna serve at this time, I'm gonna return, and then there's gonna be an outcome. Because the, the reason why I'm asking that is because while athletes can be good at transitions, the, reason, the whole reason why I'm doing this show is because I've seen athletes fail to make transitions outside of the sports world. Okay, yeah, everything you said is, is, a, is a yes, however, the, what makes transitions move well for people is when the mission is clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's use the NFL for an example, is that there's a mini mission and a large mission while people are in, in the NFL. The mini mission is every Sunday, right? So you mm -hmm. back in your entire week to organize your inner life and practice your external skills at the highest level possible together. And 
And nobody does the extraordinary alone. We need each other. True. And so that's where the bonding, the brotherhood, the connection between humans is special because there's this hard, difficult, extraordinary concept of what it could be if we all were able to fly in formation together at our best self, in our best way. So that mini mission on Sunday is electric for most. And if it's not, it's probably not the right place for you. That's okay. And then there's a larger mission over the course of the year. Okay. Now, what happens when people transition out of sport, to your point, is that the mission isn't clear. And so what is a mission? Let's talk about it in the frame of like purpose. What is your purpose? And Simon Sinek does a great job of talking about know your why. And there's a science to that. And it's the science around purpose. And it has three things. So here's, to me, and I'll deconstruct this in a second, but to me, we want to go upstream as far as we possibly can. And so that when we are downstream, like all the good stuff, the the strong rapids uh, are in place so that the output is eloquent. And we're talking about the eloquent output being transitioning well. Mm -hmm. So upstream on this is that it has to, this is purpose, the science of purpose. It has to matter to the person. So your purpose has to matter to you. I can't give it to you. Nobody else can give you purpose. It has to be something that matters to you. It's bigger than you and it's down the road. So those are the three variables to take a look at if we deconstruct purpose, the science of purpose. So athletes might struggle after sport because they can't figure out what matters for them anymore because that that was like their everything. Okay, so now let's take that insight that you just have right there and say it was their everything. What does that mean? If we deconstruct that, is that what happens for people that are highly skilled at a young age? So how old were you when you were good? Ah, uh, I was still going, Mike. (laughs) (laughs) But there was a point where people started to talk to you differently. Adults maybe treated you differently. It was early. Yeah. So let's say it's, let me just make up. Nine. Okay. That's that's super early. And so nine, 10, 11, 12, 14 teenage years, there was definitely some shaping of the conversations in your world around your athleticism. Right? Would you agree with that? One that it started very early, yeah. actually. Okay. So what would happen for you now? I don't, I'm not trying to say that I know, but yeah. what could happen for you is that during those years, your job, my job at the same age, if we take a developmental psychological approach, the science there is that you're supposed to figure out who you are. Hmm. And when athletes are really good and their entire community is focused around what they do, they foreclose on all other identities. So are you rock and roll or are you punk or are you country or are you R&B? Well, I don't know because I'm really good at rock and roll. Everyone's talking to me about rock and roll. It's kind of fun. So you foreclose on exploring. Now you're left with being great at rock and roll for that age. Okay. So what ends up happening is you fuse your identity with what you do. Now, when you go step across the the line and go compete, it's not just a game. It's identity risk. Why else would your brain say, light up the fight and flight freeze mechanisms? Why would your brain light up that there's a threat? Because it's not a physical threat. If someone's going to hit the ball hard at you, no, it's not a physical threat. It's an identity threat. And what's beautiful about the brain is that there's no redundancies. So the same systems in your brain... Am I talking too much? No, you're yeah. good. I'm, same I feel like I'm brain. in a therapy session. No, 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 this is not therapy. Saying, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, this well, is not that therapy. explains a lot. <laughs> Th- therapy is like, we, we both be crying, you know, like it's wonderful, but you know. No, so. but everything that you're saying about um, my identity being fused to what I was doing. You're, the outcome. And everything was foreclosing and shutting down. There, there was, um, I I don't think I've shared this with you, but I, that's, I went through a huge identity crisis once tennis was no longer a part of my life. And it, that transition for me took 10 years for me to really get out of that and understand, heal, and then move properly forward. How about it? So How about it? Because your identity yeah. was fused with what you were doing. So it was like this. And then when you no longer had the thing that you were doing, who am I? And there's this wrestle And so what we want to do, what we want to help people that are in it right now is decouple, decouple who I am from what I do. 
so that when the transition out moment happens, because it's going to happen, that you can eloquently let go of what I do and replace it with a something new, what I do. But your identity is integrous. It's whole. It's not dependent on doing more. So there's a model that many of us have adopted, and it's broken. And that model is, I need to do more to be more. It's broken. You know it. Yes. I need to do the extraordinary to be extraordinary. No. That, that is not Is that right. just American society? Is that our culture today? It's a Western what is that? frame. It it's is definitely a Western, a Western frame. It's a Western frame. frame. And I think it was born out of, a, like most things, a great intent during the Industrial Revolution. Our hardworking families, our grandparents, grandparents came home and they said, hey, family, you know what's coming? Machines. People are getting laid off. And I'll be damned if this family is going to suffer from some machine. So you know what? We're going to outwork this thing. We're going to outsmart this thing. No machine is going to replace this family's well-being. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. So like we came from these vibrant families that were like, yeah, let's go. And so the doing and being became mired. So what we're seeing with the most extraordinary people in the world right now is they're flipping that model and they're saying, no, 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 no. I need to be more and let the doing flow from there. I need to be more present, more grounded, more creative, more authentic, and let the doing flow from there. And nothing that I do, nothing that I do will compromise who I am. Right. That is a concept that I can understand now at 38 and being re removed from the sport. Mm -hmm. So how do you teach that? Or do you even try to teach that to a 22 year old, 24 year old, who's now a couple years into the NFL, especially if they don't have anything, they don't have any other safety net. Like this is their, this is their thing that's going to propel them yeah. to, um, a life from a life from um, where, in which they came from nothing. That's right. I think what you're picking up on and talking about is the real challenge. The reason people change is because of pain. How we grow is because we get uncomfortable. So uncomfortableness is how we grow. Pain is why we change. So if we really want to create a fundamental change, we have to help people feel pain. Help people feel, feel pain. pain. Oh and sit with the pain. So how do you help somebody pain. feel pain? Well, I mean, there's lots of ways probably to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> like when something doesn't go according to plan and they feel that sense of internal scratchiness and unsettledness, like to sit with that and to examine it and inspect it and rather than drug it, drink it, sex it, social media, it, like rather than distract from it, like feel that. And that becomes a powerful opportunity and we're talking about, in this model right now, the signal to noise ratio. And our job, it's an engineering term, but it's also a psychological principle, is that we want to help people get to the signal. And with all the bling of the world of high-performing environments, it's hard to get to the signal, that emotional signal. And so it's easier to get to the signal like, I need to be right here to catch this ball, to be able to do whatever I need to do on command. So that part is required, mm -hmm. but the emotional part of like examining the inner life, it's harder. And so I wish I could say we, we everyone like were successful hundred percent of the time, but that's not even close to how it works. I'm so interested about your background because I feel like you're, you're everywhere. You're working with people, working with teams and you're in media all the time. And people are always asking you about your advice and how you handle other people. But I feel like there's not a ton of stuff about who Michael oh, Gervais is. Are we is. going there? No. We're going deep. No, we're Mike, we're going yeah. deep. Okay, <laughs> That's why. <yeah. laughs> but I'm so interested about yeah. how you got to this point and why you want to help people so much. And if your personal experiences led you and motivate you to get to get to this point. So yeah. um, you're a California guy, mm. right? Born and I raised? Grew up, I grew up on a farm in Virginia. Did you? Yeah. See, I didn't know see, that. Yeah, see, know. this is yeah. what it's all about. This mm. is why we're doing So you grew up on a farm Yeah, first in eight, nine years, somewhere in there, on a farm, no street lights, dirt roads. Like, if I got lost in the back country and it was dark out, there was, like, it was dangerous. And so, like, I grew up in a place that had these really organic, 
hippie-ish, rugged, natural environment. And so that's where... Where in Virginia? I, yeah, it's a place called Warrington. Okay. And um, it's not that now. It's really nice. I got to go back last year. It's like, it's really nice. And so it was the beginnings of a, of a town. And so, yeah, so I grabbed some roots there. And it, you're right about California most of my life. Okay. Yeah. And then when did you move to California? I think it was uh, third grade, fourth grade. Okay. Yeah, I was in fourth grade. And what was your first exposure to sports? What, what okay, are your so first I had a memories? Couple, I had a couple. One was um, traditional stick and ball sports growing up kind of on the farm. And I was a good little athlete. Um, so I have a memory where we were late for practice. We're late for a game. And there was all the kids were on the field. And everyone looked like, oh, Mike's here. This is going to make me sound like a hero, but oh, Mike's here. And I knew that I could just run on the field and someone had to come off. It's an awful no way. story. Yeah, awful story. How old story. were you? I was like nine. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know. Get off the field. Yeah. You're amazing. Yeah, yeah, like, and I, I'm not saying I was a good athlete, but like, I, I really liked it and it came natural as a young kid. And then the second memory is that my nose is completely busted open. I took a ball to the face in soccer. Completely, I mean, there's blood everywhere. And n not one parent thought that the right thing is to pull this kid out and clean up his face. Not one referee until my shirt was soaked with blood. Now, I loved every minute. I was like, I'm a savage in here. And I'm like, <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was so competitively engrossed in what I was doing. This didn't matter. And there's no chance I wanted to come out. And so that's part of like the DNA is that I, I, I loved it. I, you know, would deal with something that was just a seemingly physical setback so that I could do the thing. And then I moved quickly when we moved to the West Coast into surfing. Actually, there's an in-between is that when we got to the big city of California, the big state um, of Los Angeles, like I tried out for the soccer team. I wasn't good enough. Oh, wow. And so I was nervous and I wasn't good enough. And I didn't, I made the B team and I went home that day to my parents. I'm like, I'm not doing B anything. But really when I look back, you know, 30 years from now, or 30 years ago, I was nervous. And then play that forward when I was 15, there was two types of surfing there. And I was, from that point forward, I said, forget stick and ball stuff. These coaches, like I didn't like the environment and I wanted consequences when I made a mistake, not somebody barking at me. Mm. And so I went into action sports where if you make a mistake, you leave skin on the asphalt, you get held under in a big wave, there's consequences. So I wanted nature to teach me consequences, which I think is a powerful learner for me. And, um, I got into the environment and what I learned quickly is there's two types of surfing. There's free surfing and competitive surfing. And the free surfing culture is all about being hardcore. What does that mean? Everything you're imagining, like be about it. Don't talk about it. Put yourself in a dangerous situation. If someone talks about it, then just kind of nod like, yeah, but be about it. And it's about being hardcore. And I also wanted to compete. So I had that thing wired because there weren't any stakes involved other than harm, okay? But the bigger stakes for me, other than the physical harm, was being judged. So I went over and tried competitive surfing. I was a mess. Hmm. I was an absolute mess. And I'm 15, and I realized in that moment that my mind, it was my mind. It wasn't my body, and it wasn't my craft. It was my mind. And I had to live with that. I didn't know what sports psychology was, but it was awful. It felt awful to not be able to access, you know this, no one chokes in sport because no one's eating while they're playing. Is that a bad joke? That's a, bad <laughs> no. joke. That's a really bad joke. It was, it was in the midst of a very serious conversation. So <laughs> I didn't know if I want, if you, you wanted want me, me to laugh. You knew, but... yeah, you knew. So, but, but, but like we micro choke, you know, we choke, what choking means is we choke off access to the thing we know we can do. Mm. And my mind had choked off access to the thing I knew I could do. And I think if we take it out of sport, that's many people's experience in life is that there's a micro choking, there's a tension based on our thought patterns, based on our framework, that there's so much more to go and give, but we're choked off because of the stress of the world, the rhythms of the world. You know, this is me moving away from me and trying to talk about not me. <laughs> Are you it's, uncomfortable talking about yourself? No, but I don't, I, it, I don't know what purpose it does really. So I don't like to talk about me. No, you know, but, but yeah. I, that's why I'm interested because everything that I look up, there's nothing 
Yeah. There's not a lot on you, but I'm interested. I'm more interested in other people. I know you are, but I'm interested in you, and Thank this you. is my show. <laughs> so- is- oh my God. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's interesting because I think that the work that you do is um, – it comes from somewhere because you, oh, yeah. you know, the last time you and I spoke was in 2016, we were doing that NFL countdown piece on the work that you do with Doug Baldwin and the mental imagery and visualization. And at the time I was also, I think it was either before or after the interview, I was, I was asking you a ton of questions about school, yeah, psychology yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. and all that stuff. Um, and I don't know if I've updated you, but since then I've got my master's in counseling psychology and I'm actually applying to grad school. That's what's up. Yes. That I'm applying to grad yes. school to get my doctorate in counseling psychology and sports psychology. Come on. So, but, um, and I'll always be thankful for all the advice right. that you offered and continue to offer me. But like, I know my motivations for getting into the field and a lot of it stems from my own issues or obstacles or hiccups in my path. And that's why I was interested in yours because Mm -hmm. the work that you do, you're helping people, you're helping Mm -hmm. athletes, but you're also helping them become better people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know your background because I know that motivation comes from somewhere. Oh yeah. Like it's been forged in fire from the, you know, the way that I grew up not being able to have freedom in anything that I did really, because I was constricted by my untrained mind. And so early days in my career, I wanted to help people. I needed to, I, I was sorting it out for myself, like how to get free. Mm-hmm. And then early in your career, like as early, in your 20s? Yeah. Like when I just started studying psychology, I was the first person to go to school in my, in my family. So oh, wow. I, the education path is like, I dropped out of graduate school too. And did you? Yeah. Like, and then at San Diego, at San Diego university? No, at uh, Pepperdine. Uh-huh. And my family was like, Oh, we thought we had one, you know, I went back, you know, but I dropped out of a traditional psychology program because it wasn't, I didn't make sense to me that I was going to spend my life studying dysfunction. I already knew dysfunction. <laughs> like it was already <laughs> like I was living it. But I, so I wanted to study like frameworks of success. Mm-hmm. And so I dropped out of there and found a- another path, which ended up being the sport performance path, which I didn't know existed. So you were in counseling psychology or was it clinical or clinical. what? It was, it was clinical. clinical. So yeah. And that's the one thing that I've, uh, it's taken me months to figure out because the mental health space and psychology space is growing. Yeah. But it's also very convoluted and confusing. So the difference for those that don't know the difference and correct me if I'm wrong, the difference between clinical and counseling clinical is more de- dealing more with psychoses and mental illness counseling is dealing more with healthy individuals mm-hmm. so it's interesting that your experience at pepperdine and going through that clinical route mm-hmm. then it switched you over to kind of like the more fun side uh, yeah, well i don't know i, if no, I just that. i didn't know there was a thing oh, I, just, okay. I dropped out okay I was, I was done and and this is grad school this is grad school now i didn't know what i was going to do mm-hmm. um there was a moment though, there's two moments in my life that I think helped shape this entrepreneur spirit that I have is that when I was eight, there was a, by this, uh, our church, there was a big tree that had these pods of beans mm-hmm. and there's all these beans and they're about the size of a quarter and round. And I picked one up and I'm walking behind my, like, I don't know, four paces behind my family and I'm dragging this bean on this brick wall. And it's making kind of this sound. And then I put it in a palm of my hand. I was like, it's hot. They're hot beans. So I went back. I grabbed as stuffed my pockets. A little eight-year-old kid stuffed my pockets with this product. I was going to go sell at school. Hilarious. I mean, so I, and I sold hot beans at school. I got in trouble for it. And I got, (laughs) you know, my mom got called up to the office for it. Only when the boys were burning the girls. Oh my gosh. So there's this entrepreneur thing that like, I, I like the building of things to be able to share. Okay? Building of things and building of people in a sense? Yeah. Well, this one wasn't. This, was okay. <laughs> this one was like you were tearing yeah, down right. people and yeah. like burning kids. Yeah. Okay. And then the other one was when I quit graduate school. And again, I want to say that I, I went back. So it mm-hmm. wasn't a, like a final quit. I went back to a new school is that I know what I was going to do. And I really respect people that have the courage to say this is not right. Because that was a hard decision. It was, this was not right. I, I had a clear path I, that people said that, Mike, you should keep going. And I dropped out because it wasn't right. And I couldn't see myself in the future doing the things that we we're studying. 
And I found a mentor of mine um, said, hey, Mike, there's this two-week job, part-time temporary job. And he goes, it's around drug prevention and, you know, it'll hold you over for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I took that two-week part-time job and ended up turning it into an 18-year program. Wow. Yeah. Where it and how was, old were you at this point? I was 20. What year are you in your kind of first year of graduate school? 23. Yeah. If you so graduate like, 22, so you're 20, like 23. I was 22. I was young. Okay. I, I went to school young. So 22. And then, so it ended up being, so I saw this government grant to help people, funded to help people do crime prevention or uh, delinquency and drug prevention. And I had this idea, well, what if like the stuff I learned in undergrad and some of the stuff I was learning in graduate school, what if I did this coaches thing or captains thing where I took mm -hmm. the high school athletes and would help them understand basic ideas of psychology. And then we built a, what's called late night sports. And it was every Saturday night for 18 years. That's where I was in my woodshed. It was an open gym, three full basketball courts. We brought in a DJ. I trained those high school kids on some life skills, which is now like sports psychology as I was going along mm -hmm. in my career. And 100, 100 athletes in a gym, neutral gang tori territory, and it was amazing. I ended up doing my dissertation on it. Wow. So it, 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 that was my woodshed where I learned. because And did you go admission. into sports because you just had that background in it? Why was it, like, why didn't you want to work with non-athletes or, or, you know, different populations yeah. or demographics? It's not sport. It is people who are dedicated to the flywheel of growth. Like okay. they really want to grow and athletes, we make a mistake by seeing the athlete on the podium and saying, look at them. That's the mistake. Cause that's about celebrating the outcome. The real opportunity is to celebrate the athletes, how they organize their life every day to be vulnerable and to go for it, to be vulnerable, to go for it, to get feedback loops, to grow. And most of us don't have accurate feedback loops, if feedback loops at all. And so that's the hard work, is to put yourself into a position to grow. But you got to really care about the arc of growth to do that hard work. So that's why. It's like, they, it. for the most part, they are extraordinary physically, but they want to get better. And that is stimulating to me. So in your fascination is with more of the high performance. So you don't necessarily, when you see an athlete, you see them holistically. And as a person, you see them as a performer, which is might explain what you're doing with compete to create with coach Pete Carroll, because you're working now with organizations and larger companies yeah. and helping them grow. I see people as in humans first mm -hmm. and the the nexus or the intersection between being and doing being a very important conversation to have and to help people be grounded and present more often and let the doing flow from there is the place that I want to add to, you know, the, the body of human flourishing. And so that's why working with athletes is stimulating because the doing and being are really important and that's being missed in enterprise companies right now. The thing that's, remarkable is so our company compete to create has five core principles self-discovery mindfulness developing a psychological framework developing mental skills and recovery mm -hmm. okay. so and we've learned that from the science and the art in, in sport in the business world there's no conversation of recovery <laughs> zero I don't not know into I, not in 2019 mm -hmm. yeah it's changing it's starting to change right now and so can you imagine an athlete as an athlete not recovering no not well, attention. you know, yes, actually, 15 years ago when yeah. or 20 years ago when I was playing where overtraining was like an absolute thing. I mean, yeah. I was I was kind of I started my um, when I moved to Florida at the age of 12, I went to tennis academy and um, it was Saddlebrook. And back then there was only really two it was Saddlebrook or Nick Voluntary, which is now the IMG. And back then it was all about quantity. And you know that, like you've seen that. Overtraining, um, under over recovery. Burnout. Staleness, but back then, fatigue. no one knew about the different ways to improve your performance. They didn't know about nutrition and strength and conditioning yeah. and rest and recovery, you know. But back then, it was just all about quantity and volume. They, they, the mindset back then was the more you work and the harder you work, the better you're going to be. And, and as we know, that's not science. true. Yeah, there's better science now. Yeah. You have to do the hard work, right, in, in craft, body, and mind. 
you've got to put in real volitional, high effort, nauseatingly focused work to get better. Like that's, it's part of the work. But if you're going to do that hard work, you have to intelligently recover. Um, the question I'm about to ask is more, it, it's, it's, um, driven selfishly because I'm curious as me, as I get into the field of counseling psychology and also with this show, the last several interviews that I've done, um, the interviewee has gotten um, emotional, uh, be, just because of the sensitive nature of the topic. It's, it's very open, it's transparent and it's very personal. A lot of it has to do with retirement. Um, and then the last interview that I just did, like I got teary eyed too with somebody who, you know, we know, and Doug Baldwin. <laughs> and so do you, as the psychologist ever take in some of the emotions that w from the person that you are working with, or how do you block that out? Okay. So we're talking about when we're doing deep emotional work with somebody, mm -hmm. um, our job my job, the way I think about it, is I need to hold the depth of reservoir. And so, meaning the depth of emotional capacity. Because let's imagine that you and I are doing some work mm -hmm. and you're the psychologist and I'm, I'm the, the, the client or the athlete. And I want to go somewhere. I want to talk about something scary or really sad. And you won't go there. You don't know how to go there or you don't or you miss the cue or I don't feel like you can go to the depths I want to go. And my my desire to go deep is limited by your ability to. Hmm. OK, so that's the first thing. So so we have to do the deep work ourselves, so that we can hold the reservoir of depth. And then when we do that and so what happens, let, let's say that this is the capacity for depth. I'm just making this up. And when we get close, to, when a human gets close to that, we rattle because we're not skilled there. It's new territory and it's scary. Okay. And so that's the same physically as well, right? Yeah. Like same psychologically is like, that's how it works. And so my job is to go as deep as I can so that if you get to hear that I'm still, I got you, like we're here in it together and I'm not going to rattle. Now I just switch roles. If I'm the, I got the psychologist, then I'm not going to rattle, but I can hold it with you and I can feel with you, and then I can be in it with you, and then what ends up happening, we think, is there's a recalibration. So you've done the work. Hopefully, yeah, and, but I'm still learning. It's not like... And how did you do that work? Well, I spent a lot of time in the seat being a client. I spent okay, so you, you went through therapy yourself. Of, hundreds of hours. Was that on, um, did you have to do that for training, or did you, on your own volition? Both. Do it voluntarily. Yeah. Okay. So the first kind of poke at it was with my mentor, who was a who was a mentor of mine, right? So I never exchanged money with him. He's a wonderful human, Gary De Blasio, and he happened to be a therapist, and he was in my life early as a mentor. So I did lots of deep work with him. Then in graduate school, everybody needed to go do work, and so I got some starting with some formal work there, and then postgraduate school, post PhD. Um, I was like, yeah, like I want to keep continuing hmm. because my wife kicked me out of the house when we were seven years married and it was because of my inability to be a good partner. And she brought me, so this is a transition. She brought me to a place that said, I love you. You're a wonderful human, but I'm not sure how to be me in the, in, in this relationship anymore. And so it was, that was a moment, that was a place in my life that was like game changing. And how old were you then? I was 32. Okay. So 32. Yeah, I got married young. We got married young. Okay. Um, and so I left the house knowing that this is, I know from the science mind, I'm like, this is the beginning of the end. Marital therapy, unfortunately, is really divorce preparation for many people. Mm. And so... I wish it wasn't that case. And maybe I'm, maybe that's old data and maybe there's something newer and better, I hope. But I, at the time I was like, this is the beginning of the end. Oh mm -hmm. no. And, um, and so what ended up happening for us is that we did incredible work. <laughs> like, so it was the beginning of a new beginning. Oh yeah. And cool part of the story is, you know, we're, we're still married yeah. and we worked that transition. It was like, 
it was the absolute best thing that I've done. So my long way of saying, sitting and doing the deep work with people that can hold the capacity and reflect truth, it's a massive accelerant to growth. And so, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be around those mm -hmm. wise men and women that have helped me do that. Interesting. That's, you know, the field in which I'm watching people help other people. Now I'm going to be looking at them. It's like, have you done the work yourself? I don't think that you could be a good psychologist or therapist in any fa fashion without having an understanding of your own story. And as you mentioned, yeah. just kind of having that deep reservoir of. There's a, there's a question that one of my um, professors asked in graduate school and said, there's a bunch of kind of really switched on bright minds. And, and he says to us, it was like, I don't know, two or three months before we we're going to graduate. And he kind of stops the class and he looks at us and he says, what gives you the right? What makes you think that you're going to be able to help anyone in this planet? So, That's a good question. And so then we each had to answer. He's like, really? Like, now he is a v retired vet that made a decision. He's a PhD as well, made a decision. Intel was coming in, uh, in Vietnam to go east, he decided to go west, and his best friend and much of his squad perished. Uh. So he'd been through it. He'd been in it. And he's like, really? You're going to help someone like me? It's like, oh, yeah. Right. I'm staying up here on the surface of sports psychology. No, 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 no. Go deep, son. Like, Got really it. touch the, the pain of life. Touch that deep part that um, know yourself and know other people. That's mm -hmm. a really powerful Thing that he gave us so i'd say the same to you like when you're doing this work like go do the work as much as you oh, i've been in therapy can. for seven there eight years <laughs> so you've done some work now uh, oh yeah i mean it's a huge reason why i'm doing it because yeah. i have learned firsthand the power of the mind and power of psychology and how one person can change not just one area of our life, but she changed everything, mm -hmm. you know? And that was during the time when I was, even just a couple of years ago, when I was going through my tennis comeback, she knows absolutely nothing about sports, mm -hmm. nothing. But she was able to help me with my performance on the tennis court. And even when I was during my time at ESPN in my world of broadcasting. And that really just like opened my eyes to, to the magic of that. That's great. It is really great. So, when you're working with these players and you have this deep reservoir and experience with, with all of that, um, how do you, where, where do you begin? Because a lot of these guys, especially in the NFL, I mean, out of all the sports that I've covered and, and have experience in, I think the NFL is probably the most, has the most macho, um, just kind of traditional old school way of thinking mm -hmm. where it's like completely suppress the emotions, absolutely no feeling. And some of the coaches that we still see today, um, certainly not the, the P Carroll's of the world, but there's still of the, you know, yelling, cursing, berating. Um, I've heard stories of some other environments in the NFL that sound absolutely abusive, like yeah. flat out. 100%. If that was a family system, you'd pull your kid right out of there. Yeah. You know, like, it was a school system that, you know, yeah. I'd say it starts at the Seattle Seahawks with coach Carroll's deep investment in psychology. He's got an advanced degree in it. He understand it. It's woven in the DNA of the culture that he's built. And so people are more available to talk about things because, you know, like they understand the value of the mind. He talks about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not, I don't want to also paint a picture that like every time I'm talking to somebody is this mm -hmm. deep, Sometimes we're talking about no, no, like no. Yeah. whatever, you know, like way up at the surf and it's fun. It's we're talking about things to build rapport and but you're creating space for people if they want to do that work that it's there. And so I, I think your question is like, where do you start? You start with wherever they are. Oh, OK. So meet them where they sweat. Mm -hmm. Literally sometimes and figuratively in the sense of like, pay attention. People are teaching you all the time who they are. My job is to, without judgment or critique, notice and observe and be part of it and stay here if they want to be here. Try to poke down if they want to do some work. If they want to come back up, no problem. It's not awkward, you know, and just so meet them where they are mm -hmm. and I, understand where yeah. they want to go. And I, and I ask that because I am of the belief that if you work on yourself as a person, not just superficially, but internally, that makes you perform much better, not just on the court or the field, but in all areas of your life. And knowing that 
that's, um, I was just curious as to how you can get deep inside with some of these players. And I know some of these players, um, are willing to go there and that, and I learned that from my piece with you and Doug, Doug Baldwin, because, you know, as we know, he's very intelligent, but he's very introspective. He's very deep. And you guys had started doing some work together since 2012, right? And that was a year where he kind of had the so-called so sophomore slump a little bit. He had a great rookie season and started experiencing um, some injuries in 2012. And you guys started doing some meditation, mindfulness, and more importantly, the mental imagery. And, um, you know, I, I was just curious how you can get there with the player. But as you said, you kind of, you just kind of have to take their lead. You can't really yeah. force them anywhere. right? No, like just, so I've got a wonderful partner in this, which is coach Carol saying, Hey, you know, <laughs> the mind matters. <laughs> and so we're going to, we're going to talk about how to get better mm -hmm. and we need to invest in it. So in that framework, that was why I was attracted to work with the Seattle Seahawks is because of coach Carol's deep investment in craft body and mind and to do it better than it's ever been done before is one of his mottos. And then you've got folks that want to go there, like Doug and other athletes, and there's some that are like, they have no interest in it. That's right. okay, that's fine. And then I've got this really unique story that I get to come with because the projects and the places I've been have been so consequential. Red Bull Stratos, when Felix Baumgartner jumped from 128,000 mm -hmm. feet, it's so consequential. When Luke Aikens, since we last spoke, Luke Aikens jumped from a plane at 30,000 feet without a parachute into a 16 story net that he built. So you better have command of craft body and mind because it's a binary outcome. Either you hit the target or you don't. Oh my God. And so I'm fortunate enough to have these really electric stimulating consequential environments that I've been part of that they recognize the athletes I work with in these environments recognize that those environments where mistake costs life, limb of self or other, mm -hmm. that you better get your stuff right. And I want some of that. Mm. Uh, what are some of the different transitional moments that you deal with, with, um, with athletes? I and mean, you know, you and I were talking about, you know, there's, there's the transition from high school to college to college to pros, which is the one that, um, that you often deal with, with a lot of the rookies. Uh, there's obvious injury, there's retirement. And even though a lot of your, a lot of your work is dealing with the active players, so you probably don't deal too much with the retired players because at that point they're they're gone. But what are what are all the transitions that you might help athletes navigate? Those are the big ones. There's micro transitions between, you know, um, slumps in performance. There's micro transitions like I thought I could, but now I can't, and so making that transition from a bit of loss, you know. So there's a micro transition in there for folks, and then there's the third contract folks where they get to the third contract and you know that's the contract where money is like it's legacy family money where it changes it can change much and i'm not saying first contracts or second contracts are insignificant but if you get to a third contract we're talking hundreds you know of, of millions of dollars so there's a transition there while they're still playing managing that new space. Mm -hmm. and so that's a transition as well. Yeah. When you mentioned that uh, yesterday when we were speaking, I thought, you know, I never thought about that. And yeah. it, and I believe you said that you had specialized your work around that co third contract transition for a while. Yeah. Um, when, when, when was that in, in terms of you just working with athletes or specializing your, your work around that? It happened in two pathways. One is, so this was long ago with the private practice is that it's expensive, <laughs> right? Like my, so, so the people needed some sort of resources to be able to have access. And then as I got better, the prices got better and it started just to be reserved for people that were kind of in that space. And so it was a natural thing that took place. And what happens for people in that third transition, that third contract, is that their psychological framework becomes challenged or exposed. And so the framework is the way that we understand who we are and the world. And there's a small psychological shift or psychological framework shift entering into the league for some. For some, it's dramatic. Mm -hmm. And this third contract, it, it gets exposed a little bit because there's a different expectation. There's a different way that people relate. There's a different calling from the family than ever before. 
And so the psychological frameworks gets challenged. And those that are built on something sturdy, mm -hmm. that are more bedrock based rather than sand and, you know, shifty based, then then it works. And so mm -hmm. that's where we spend time. Is there any one transition that that really stands out that you're like, this is the one that I deal with by far the most? No. I, no? no, really? No, I, I'm more interested in the micro transitions day to day than the macro transitions okay. in and out. And the micro transitions is about embracing that unfolding, unpredictable, unknown. Because there's a transition right now between this moment and then this moment. No. Like, I don't know how you're going to respond and what you're going to say, and nor do you know for me. So I'm much more interested in the micro transitions that we get mm. reps at, you know, 1,440 minutes, moments a day. Like, so we get lots of reps inside of every day. So if we can get better at those, the bigger transitions become easy. I never thought about like that. I never, because I think in my head, we all know the macro transitions of career change and starting a family yeah. or, um, you know, going back to school, mm -hmm. an injury, retirement. Mm -hmm. But do you think working on those micro transitions allows people to navigate the bigger ones better? Oh, yeah. A thousand percent. Uh, how so? To manage the micro transitions from moment to moment requires the ability to be present. And when you're present and you can stitch together moments, you get insight. So that's the whole purpose of being in the present moment. It's where high performance is expressed, wisdom is revealed. But there's a step in between um, being present and wisdom, and that's called insight. So when you get a bunch of moments together, you get some insights. Oh, that's how that works. Oh, oh, that's how that works. And so when you get a bunch of insights together, you have some wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where am I going with this is that being in the present moment allows for you, for you to understand the truth of something. And if you can't get to the truth, transitions, macro transitions are going to be hard. Mm. If you get to the truth right now and get a bunch of these moments together, then you get to the truth of who you are and how you deal with the unknown. Because mm. the transition is from old framework to new, and the new is unknown. And so we have to really work at getting better at embracing the unfolding, unpredictable unknown, mm. which is always available right now. Yeah. Uh, and then what about, how do you work with athletes who, what if they are present, but they don't want to be present, if that makes sense, because it's that uncomfortable. So if somebody is going through a dip in confidence or um, a stressful situation or uh, an injury where they don't like the present moment, it makes them feel inadequate, they're fearful. How do you? Yeah. They don't like the way they're responding to the moment. They don't mm -hmm. like the way they feel in the moment, right? It's not the moment. The moment is the moment. This is, yeah. this is the moment, but how you and I are engaging in this, if I don't like how I feel in this, that's on me. That's my inability to manage the demands of this environment. And go back to what we talked about earlier, is that the reason people change is because of pain. The reason we grow is by staying in the uncomfortable space longer. Mm. And so, Either way, helping people feel pain or stay in the uncomfortable space longer, we learn. Or maybe we fundamentally change. There's no hacks, secrets, tips, tricks. There's, there's no shortcuts to this thing. It's a fundamental commitment, orientating your life around growth, around progressive growth, if you can. There are no shortcuts to mastery mm -hmm. of self or craft. So what happens if you, I, I know a lot of the work that you do, it's not always just kind of a one-on-one -on -one, sit down yeah. in a room it's very casual you'll mm -hmm. kind of float and talk to these guys mm -hmm. on the bus right mm -hmm. um so what if an athlete you can tell that they're in need of help they're coming back from an injury and they come up to you and they're like mike this just this sucks i hate I, i'm trying to get back i want to be back on the field and you can see that they're in pain so where do you where do you start how do you pull them and help them through this period of of change are we on the bus? <laughs> you know, are we, are we on the sidelines? What are about, we in the, what, if in the we're hallway? practice sidelines and he's sitting there and he's like, I just, this, this stinks. I, I want to be healthy and, um, he's I'm frustrated funk. Yeah. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm, I'm over it, whatever yeah. kind of thing. I, I, I very, so first thing is like, get the context right. Is that we're not facing each other when this conversation is happening. We're both facing the field. 
Yeah. So now, like, think about that for just a moment. It's a very kind of social savvy thing right. that our elbow, our, our shoulders are kind of matched and we're watching out here. So there's a social um, safety in that. Mm. This is way more intense. True. It's way more intimate. So, so then I might take a moment and say, do you want to do some work around it? Oh. And then, nah, I just, you know, I'm just frustrated, dude. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, you know, how's it going? And then we're back to the casual part. Like, how's it going? And, and it's just meant to be a conversation to be light and be a good ear. And then there's times like in that moment, like, do you, do you want to do some work? And like, yeah, it's like, great. And then we just go to work. Like, so but it's not them, there. You're right. It's not there. We're not doing the work there. <laughs> right. right. But with somewhere else. And then maybe we go back up a couple levels and, and now our, our shoulders are back to back or to each other. And we're having a conversation like, what, what is the hard part? And there's like little moments, like what's the hard part? And we're watching practice or the game. So Got that's, it. yeah. So that's, does, it is interesting though, that you, it's like you're doing the work without them knowing that they're doing work. We're always doing work. <laughs> <laughs> like all of us are always doing work. How effective is it though? Yeah. Like you're doing right now, you're working to try to find the best words to match your curiosity. I'm working to try to find the best <laughs> words to our. Try How, to am How am I doing? How am I doing? I'm enjoying the conversation. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and how do how does your work you think prepare some of these guys for life after sport? It's for them to know. You know, like um, I'm sure that some it's helped dramatically and some it's been a miss, you know, like I haven't, I wasn't available enough or the timing wasn't right or the, we didn't have the thing that, you know, the, the magic, if you will. So I wish I could say that it was, everything was great always, you know, like, yeah. but I do know that when it's, I think, I don't know this, it's not evidence-based or science-based, but I think that for me, at least I need to have a conversation x number of times before it's like oh okay oh wow and i'm just one part of that sequence mm -hmm. with other people and so they have to do the work yeah it can't just be with you no no no, no. yeah they, ha they have and to be so, going through a process of curiosity and self-reflection and awareness too not a whole lot happens without awareness yeah. and a discovery approach to the amazing experiences of what it means to be human when we lack that, we, we really do shortchange mm -hmm. our potential. Why do you think some athletes can achieve a high level of performance in their own domain, but then when it goes, to, when it extends to other fields, then they completely fall short and collapse? The like, transferability of skill. Yeah. Why, yeah. What happens with that? Because yeah. the reason That's why I wanted question. to do this show is because of that. Like and, you knew how to be on time, you right. knew how to, how to work your tail off, mm -hmm. you knew how to be coached, you know how to try to be your very best and even compete with the best. Mm -hmm. You know how to have a plan, invest in the plan, work well with others. Doesn't that sound like a, a great partner in business or life? Yeah. Yeah. So, so where does the trans? Well, it goes back to who am I? Because the identity foreclosure thing has happened and they're so closely mired with who I am and what I do, that when the doing part goes away, they're not sure who they are. Mm -hmm. And so if you can pull those apart and have them be separate, but related, but, re but related, then when the doing goes away, that you know what, who you are and the skills that you have that are transferable. So if there's a crisis happening, it's, it's, it's because who am I? And I don't even know if I can do anything other than play ball. You've got a lot of capabilities underneath. And those capabilities, almost all of them are transferable. Agreed. Yeah. I feel like, I hope I'm not offending anybody by saying this, but, you know. Um, well, it's good to have a point of view now. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Well, yeah, I'm not yeah. exactly the hot take artist, and I, nor do I really want to be. But mm -hmm. um, this is just coming from my experience through my friends, mm -hmm. you know, observing um, other athletes and other sports and also being a member of the media. I think the one I think the one um, area where I see athletes struggle the most is probably football players. Mm. And I don't know if that has to do with our American culture being putting football on a pedestal and it being the most 
popular sport for a number of years. And then at the youth level, something about the culture where their identity is so deeply wrapped into football Mm -hmm. that when it's gone, they really struggle. And I I don't know, I, I, what do you, am I wrong? Do you have a different, do you have a counter? The statistics are alarming. And so I don't know the statistics in other sports in stick and ball sports, but I would say that it's complicated. The human experience is complicated and there is so, I don't know if I could have done it at this age. I, I, we talk about that all the time. Coaches and I, and we'll talk about that a lot is like, could you have handled this type of access and resource at that age? I don't know. No, I mean, I, you're talking about like the money, the social media, the attention, the recognition, everything. Yeah. It's complicated. Fame. Yeah, yeah. Especially with that identity foreclosure piece we're talking about. So it's just complicated. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, it is interesting though, talking to, to different athletes, um, and comparing the experiences of different sports. Um, yeah. <laughs> different challenges. Like I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how the, e- the true ecosystem for other environments work, mm-hmm. you know, but I do know that this is a short career in the NFL. Yeah. Not for long. It's a short career for many. And um, most of the money's gone. You take 50% from taxes and then another X percentage from managers, lawyers, you know, agents. And then by the time you're left, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of money for most. Mm -hmm. And so that's hard. That's really hard. How has this sport? I'm sorry, with the lack of a mission and Mm -hmm. clarity and Mm -hmm. identity and all of that, it gets really tricky. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No. um how with the with the change in the media landscape and also sports landscape, how have you tweaked some of your methods or uh, or your approach when working mm-hmm. with athletes? Because time times are constantly mm-hmm. changing. I feel like every sport changes every five years. Every mm-hmm. sport goes through some sort of evolution. Mm-hmm. So have you tweaked any of your approaches? I'm not sure that most athletes right now are truly psychologically prepared to deal with social media. And so converting from um, it being a conversation relationship thing, which is not what this is really meant to be, more of like a sharing of ideas, that would be that would be a better way to think about social media. And so I don't have a really great answer other than the challenges are different, but it's still challenging the same core parts of the human experience. Mm -hmm. Do I matter? And how do I know that? belonging is at the foundation and the core of the human experience. But if we're going to get belonging from something digital and distant, it becomes very convoluted. And so belonging is supposed to happen from doing hard things, intimate things with people together and knowing that you're able to contribute to the wellness of other communities and people. So, that's one of the reasons belonging matters, but where are you going to get that source of belonging? And if it's social, social media, then it's not, it's not great. I can't imagine that you, much of your work is in helping athletes deal with social media. No. I, I don't think so, no. but, yeah. but I know at the, but stress and anxiety yeah. and like worrying about like the pressure, where's pressure. Okay. Yeah. Where does pressure come from? Myself, the yeah. person and built on what? Um, expectations from, Myself. And? And sometimes others. other people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so yes. where we get these self expectations is like this thought and model that, well, they said I should, and I think I should, and it's not working out that way. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's a comparison model that gets built into it. So pressure is like the experience, like I need to do or think faster than I'm capable of doing. Mm-hmm. And it usually comes from external sources, but most people say that it comes from within because we create, the, we, we don't have the psychological framework to deal with that fast thinking mm. or fast movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go back because I have a question. And I, when we went through that little pause a couple of minutes ago is because I had my question and I forgot it. But when you're working with some of these athletes and you know that a lot of their identity is wrapped up in their performance and what they do, so we're talking to the audience now of youth sports, the coaches work with kids. 
How do you prevent that in terms of there being a complete identity crisis as a transition? Maybe it's transition to the NFL. Um, they get that third contract or even if they walk away from the sport. Where does that start as a kid? I, I love the question. Kids leave sport because of the car ride home. And so let's just, let's stay there for a minute, is what happens in the car ride home? So what happened on that third down, Joey? You know, hey, you know, in the fourth quarter when you didn't take that shot and, you know, you had a turnover? So the conversation on the ride home is um, so hard for kids that they're like, forget about it. And that's because the parents are asking questions about the doing, usually the mistakes. Yeah. Right, And if it's a great thing, whatever, then they're asking questions about the, the hype, the, how great it was. And it's still easy to have that experience like, oh, it's all about the doing. And so conversations that are snapped into place about, hey, what was it like for you? Like, I love watching you play. Like, thank you for like, you know, doing this thing. Like, it's such a joy for me to see you, you figuring it out. This or, is what parents should say. Yeah. Like, hey, um, what risks did you take? Or what'd you learn about yourself or, you know, nothing and go get ice cream, you know, like, mm-hmm. so making you sport an adult arena is one of the reasons. I mean, even just talking about that car ride makes me cringe and I'm not even playing. I'm so I'm, I'm 30 years, 20 years removed from playing, but that dang car ride home is so, and my parents, God bless them. They were on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most intense. They were like a three, but even, even then as an athlete, like no one wants to lose. No one wants to perform poorly, you know, yeah, um, everyone that, cares about what yeah. most people care, but they're kids. Yeah. So what we, you want to have conversations with them about things that they can control. Things they can and do less about, about their res- the result. Yeah, and you more can't about control the result. Mm-hmm. That's a, you exactly got it. And it and is some of it wrapped up in a conversation between the parents and the kids about hey, you're more than just I love you for I love more. you because you breathe. I love you because yeah. you're part of this family and your morals are intact and you're figuring it out and you're a learner just like me. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining the show. Um, do you have any lasting advice for a lot of athletes out there who are going through any sort of transition, whatever it may be? Yeah, um, I don't like to give advice because um, who am I? So I've never lived in somebody else's shoes. So I like to ask more questions than advice. And I think some really important questions are, who am I? And just start with like examining that for the rest of your life. Like, who am I? And what usually happens for people is they go from role into something far deeper. And it happens pretty quickly because we are so much more than the role we inhabit. And so self-discovery, if you're thinking about what are the right questions and who am I and where do I want to go in my life, that process of self-discovery is rich and sometimes scary. Mm -hmm. And to do that with somebody that you really trust is awesome and somebody who's skilled even better uh you want to let people know where they can find you yeah sure um two places compete to create.net is the business that coach and i built to help pull back the curtain on how to train your mind to live in the present moment more often it's available for enterprise companies as well just now we're really excited we're offering it to individuals as well so it's really a fun time for us and then finding mastery.net is the podcast it's conversations with the most extraordinary thinkers and doers in the world. You've got some good guests. Yeah, Abby Wambach, uh, Steve Kerr, yeah. Pete Carroll, mm-hmm. Andrew Zimmerman, president of Boeing, yet to be Prince of I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Mike, thank you so thank much for you. coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I know that was probably a lot of information to digest because Mike is a wealth of knowledge, but I'm hoping you took something away from that conversation. And I think the thing that stands out to me as I listen back to this interview is the part where I ask him about how the work he does with athletes prepares them for life after sport. And his answer was really interesting and also really honest. And it was, yeah, sometimes it lands and other times it's a complete miss because he wasn't available enough or it was just bad timing or the athlete wasn't connecting with what he was saying. And for me, it was just a good reminder that 
even when we are trying to help someone, whether it's an athlete or a family member or a friend or a peer, whoever, they have to be ready for the message and they have to want to be helped and helped in that way because you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped. And so if I were relating it back to the show, even if an athlete has all the appropriate resources to help guide them in their transition from sport and prepare them for that post-retirement career, that may or may not be enough. And ultimately, the person has to go through it. They have to go through their own journey, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to really figure things out for themselves. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to hit me up on all my social media platforms. As always, always want to hear your thoughts at Prim underscore Seripipat. The next chapter with Prim Seripipat is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.